And uh, my name is uh, Tzvi Bendor Benit. I am from NYU. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, a very brief, uh, quick um, historical overview, um, the first part of, wit, of which I will be doing, and my colleague, or Professor Reed Bashkin, will do the second part. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about where is Iraq and where is where to locate Iraqi Jewish history actually in the pre-modern period. And I have to warn you that the pre-modern period for me begins very, very early. But actually, let's begin with something very recent. Uh, I'd like to introduce you this man. This man, anybody knows him? Of course. I think we met in Or Yehuda. Yeah. OK. This man is, you know, when you, when you ask who is the greatest uh, Jewish general in the 20th century, everybody says Moshe Dayan. But actually, no, not Moshe Dayan. Jack Jacob. Jack Jacob was the chief of staff of the Eastern, uh, Eastern Indian Army in the uh, 1971 Indo-Pakistani War that uh, um, ended up, you know, with an Indian victory and created uh, the state of Bangladesh. Yes, if you remember anything about you know, Indian history, so after the British, after the um, um, the Indian independence, there was a terrible civil war, and India was uh, uh, partitioned into two countries, two states, Pakistan and India. And, in, and Pakistan itself was divided between Pakistan and Eastern Pakistan, which is Bangladesh. Okay, there was a war in '71, and Bangladesh was created. Who is Jack Jacob? Jack Jacob was born to a Baghdadi family in Kakata. Um, he says in his autobiography that the family arrived from Baghdad in the 1780s to Kakata. We could debate that um, in terms of, you know, maybe a decade here, a decade there. But, you know, um, there's no, um, there's no uh, uh, doubt that, he, that the family arrived in Kakata, which is in Bengal, as part of you know, the ongoing trade networks um, and uh, trade uh, uh, activity you know, that uh, was running for centuries um, in the Indian Ocean, of which you know, many, many groups, such as Hadramis from Yemen, um, different Yemenis, Armenians, um, uh, and, 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 and so on, were you know, spreading in the Indian Ocean. And Baghdadi Jews were a very, very important part of it. I mean, of course, we're going to talk later about you know, the, high, the, the rise of this uh, uh, network into prominence in the 19th century. But perhaps the, the Jacob family was arriving a little bit before that as part of a more traditional you know, Indian Ocean trade, of which Baghdad and Iraq were part of it. That's very, very important because um, there has been a word yesterday, obviously, I mentioned the critique, you know, Ella's critique about, you know, the Eurocentristic approach to um, uh, Iraqi Jewish history. I would like to uh, put a geographic, uh, uh, dimen the geographic dimension to that and actually look locate Iraqi Jewish history within an imperial uh, uh, history, within the history of, you know, Asian empires, without which you cannot understand that. And one of the things that is important is that Europe doesn't play a role in it almost at all, pretty much until the end. So this is uh, Jack Jacob. What's his story? He started uh, um, as an artillery officer in the Indo, uh, um, in the Anglo-Indian uh, army, you know, that was created by the British while they were still colonizing India. And then, you know, he, uh, after the uh, liberation of independence of India, he became an officer in the Indian Army, rose to become a, a lieutenant general, a major general, um, and then, you know, became the hero of the war um, in uh, the hero of the war um, in 71. He's a very well used to be, he was a very respected man in, uh, um, in India, pretty much to the end. This is him with Narendra Modi uh, very recently. He passed away in 2016. Um, kept his Jewish identity, was very proud of it, and was very proud also of his Iraqi, uh, Iraqi Jewish uh, uh, heritage. Okay. Um, it's interesting to think about the biography of, uh, of Jacob, because he's part of, he's the family history is part of, you know, the imperial, uh, the imperial tradition, you know, that um, is part of, uh, you know, let's say Ottoman activities in the Indian Ocean in the, 18, in the 16, 17th and 18th century, if you know the work of Giancarlo Casale about that, the Ottomans were in the Indian Ocean. 
Um, and later on, you know, of course, the British uh, activities in the Indian Ocean, and his family is part of that. But one of the interesting things about him that he, he's part of also of the transition to the nation state, you know, from empire to the nation state. Okay, which I'm going to discuss in a second uh, uh, much more uh, seriously. Of course, the nation state that we're talking about here is not Israel, not the UK, post-imperial UK, not, uh, um, and not, of course, the modern nation state of Iraq. You know, these are the dramatic displacements that are happening. Okay, I'm talking about empires. Okay, here he, you can see him here um, standing behind uh, uh, the chief of staff of, of India, you know, with the Pakistani uh, general who is uh, quite depressed, he's sending what they call the instrument of surrender, okay, after the war, okay. Now, so remember this, the biography of a person who sought as part of an empire, part of imperial history, ended up, you know, as a national hero, but here's the, the catch, not of Israel, not of England, you know, but of, uh, um, but of the nation, modern nation state of India. And in, he's also a hero in, in Bangladesh as well. Okay. Now, when we want to understand Iraqi Jewish history, we need to locate it within, you know, within the context of Asian empires mostly. Yes. And to this, to, to this extent, we need to understand also that the British Empire is, a certain, it is in fact, an Asian empire of sorts you know, at a later uh, uh, period. So, and Iraqi Jews are part of, you know, this appeal activity all the time. In many ways, you know, they benefit from this, uh, 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 from all imperial activities, you know, because empires like minorities. I was here a year ago at SOAS and I presented the work of a, the British geographer of Bengal in the 1790s, who was already writing about the fact that they need to bring Iraqi Jews uh, uh, um, uh, this is before the Sassoons to, to colonize India and to help, you know, build everything because, you know, they were skilled, they were literate, and they could do, they would be very useful for the empire. This is actually, and I'm going to try to show you here in the brief moments that I have, this is something that was going on back at least 2,000 years before, okay? Now, we all know the story, um, you know, these are the, um, um, these are the main empires that come here, and, you know, Mesopotamia is between the Iranian plateau, that of course produced a series of empires, the Ahamenids, the Sasanians, the Parthians, etc., 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 reaching in fact all the way to India and China, connecting Iraq to the Chinese, to the Indian world, to the Persian world, and to the uh, ultimately to the Chinese world. You have to understand that part in order to understand Iraqi Jewish history, and in fact Iraqi history in general. Okay. At the same time, Iraq is also is part of the crescent, uh, the Fertile Crescent, and you know it is connected to the Middle East and in modern, in the modern period, to the Arab, uh, to the Arab Middle East. Of course, that was not always that the case, you know. So most of its history is actually something that has to do with you know dimensions and, and uh, dynamics of ancient trade, uh, and so on. So, and we can even tell. We can even tell that in the ancient, ancient period, you know, the Jews who settled in, in, in Mesopotamia during the Babylonian exile were actually doing pretty good. How do we know that they're doing pretty good? When Ezra, who is basically a Persian bureaucrat, comes to Jerusalem to build a, a Persian province there, not the temple, but in fact a Persian province that's going to be loyal to the Persians, you know, most of the Babylonian Jews don't want to come with him, okay? This is the fact of early incarnation of the Arab Jew debate. They want to stay in Babylon, you know, and he, there's a whole thing about, you know, how to come and, and how to, most of them do not come with him back to, uh, uh, to Judea. They like to stay there and, you know, they are very, uh, we should assume that they are very powerful, you know, economically and culturally. This is the place where uh, various texts of the Pentateuch are being re-edited, in fact, written for the first time, you know, it's a huge, uh, it, it's a community that's probably doing well. If you read the final words in the, in the Book of Kings, you will see that, you know, the king of Babylon took uh, uh, the king Yehoiachin out and he gave him food and he took him out of the prison and he gave him food and everything's fine and he's very, very happy, okay? This is probably a very, very ancient message about, you know, how this early, early Mesopotamian Jew diaspora in, in there is doing well and it's doing well because, you know, the empire is cultivating them. Okay. Now, uh, we have to uh, move on. These are the Babylonians. And pay attention to where Iraq is located. You know, Iraq is, 
has connections to the Middle East and to the Mediterranean, but mostly it's back. The back is a huge Asian back, huge Asian la landmass, and of course the mouth of the Indian Ocean leading to that. This is the most uh, traveled uh, ocean in, in human history. A lot of trade activities. Think about Maimonides, whose brother was, you know, uh, trading in the in the Middle Ages there, and so on. So Jews are part of that, you know, and that affects their history. Uh, um, a lot. In fact, this is what probably bring Jews to Baghdad um, and to Mesopotamia in different uh, in different moments. You know, when things are good. It's not that you know. You know, Iraqi Jews like to say that they've been there. You know, for 20, 2,600 years. That's not true. They're coming and going depending on, on how Baghdad is doing. You know, and where Baghdad is in the world. Okay. We move on very quickly to uh, to the uh, Persian uh, uh, to to the Persian empires. There were various Persian empires, and if you can see, you know, Iraq, Iraq, and Iraqi Jewry within this context is located which are pretty much in the middle. Yes, um, you have connections to this area, but you also have connections uh, 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 um, to this area. This is how you know, in fact, the Baghdadi or the Iraqi Jewish dialect was created. You know, and in fact, the Iraqi Arabic itself. Well, he's created in the same way, you know. If you, I now started uh, learning the Muslim dialect, uh, beautiful book by someone named Yasin Al Khalsi, and if you see, you know, that the Iraqi alphabet has, you know, the Ottoman letters, has the Persian letters, a lot of Persian words, a lot of uh, Ottoman words. You know, this is pretty much part of that uh, world linguistically, uh, in terms of the food and in terms of everything. This is part of the trade. Jews, being a literate minority, are very much active. Um, um, in that part, you know, they don't tend to lend to own land, so they are very, very mobile in in this in this context. So, in fact, they are part of a much greater world. Okay, and the way they uh, how they do it, they do it very simply. You know, if Baghdad is at the center of this world, then doing great. But if Baghdad is not in the center of this world, they are not doing very great because Baghdad is not doing very great and kind of like uh, very much is in the margins. Okay, so. In the Abbasid Empire, of course, the, uh, or the Abbasid Caliphate, particularly the early years, you know, then Baghdad is doing great. It's the center of the world. This is probably when the most wonderful uh, verb in Arabic is created, tabaghdada, yes, which means to become a Baghdadi, but also to become, become snobbing and arrogant. Why not? You know, you live, this is New York of the ancient, of the, of the 10th century, of the 9th century, you know, you live there, you're good. And if you know anything about this period, you know, it's a very, very advanced city, very, very, uh, um, very important, more than a, a hospital, science, and so on. And plenty of people are actually coming from the Persian world uh, uh, to live there, you know, with trade networks that are going all the way back uh, to China uh, and so on. Jews are certainly part of that as accountants, as, um, um, as bureaucrats, as clerks, and so on. This is the time where, you know, Hebrew grammar is, is in fact, invented. It is invented exactly at the same time where you have Persian grammarians and, and Arab grammarians inventing Arabic grammar, pretty much at the same, um, um, as the, as the same time. See, think about Sibawaihi, for one, for, for the Arabic equivalent, and think about Dunash ben Lavrat, you know, for the Hebrew one. Okay, a lot of science, a lot of so on. So Iraq, and so Baghdad and the Jews of Baghdad are doing very well. Okay, we're jumping to, uh, uh, we're jumping uh, very quickly to uh, the Mongol Empire, the Ilkhanid Empire, and you see actually something that is very, very different. In fact, Baghdad is now on the margins of a new empire. It's very much based mostly on the east, you know, the Ilkhanids were, were, uh, were, in fact, Mongols. Hulegu comes to Baghdad in 1258, destroys Baghdad completely. But, you know, the Mongols very, very uh, uh, swiftly realize that they need to cultivate certain groups within the uh, populated, uh, uh, the conquered population, you know. So this is when the moment where they restore the, uh, the Jewish community and they restored the institutions and the autonomy of the Jewish community, which were in decline, you know, in the two centuries before that. Why did they do that? They need the money. They need the trade. They're very much involved in that uh, um, and so on. Mongol princes were very much also uh, involved in the, um, in the trade in the Black Sea. And, and you can see also connections between Jews going all the way to the north here and, of course, as part of the Indian Ocean. Okay. We don't know much about this period, but we can infer a lot, you know, from what's going on, from other people who are telling us stories. Think of Marco Polo in this context and others. You know, he was in China, but he was also part of traveling in the Ilkhanid Empire. 
Okay, but Baghdad itself is actually very, very marginal within that context. It doesn't have any connection to the to the Mamluk control Middle East, and it's it's on the margins of the Persian Mongol world. Okay. Um, after the Mongols, between the Safavids and the Ottomans, you know, Iraq is in fact a territory that is kind of disputed. You know, it's heavily influenced. It's ostensibly in the hands of the Ottomans, but it's heavily it, it disputed uh, between. It, it, there's a dispute between the Safavids about the Ottomans of this territory, and in fact, this is the period where you have a black hole in in Iraqi Jewish history. We don't know much, you know, because. We don't know to which archive to go, to the archive of the Safavids or the archive of the Ottomans, particularly 16th and 17th century. Okay. When the Ottoman Empire finally seizes control over Iraq, we find a situation that, you know, this is an empire that doesn't have the Asian back. It's actually oriented more towards Europe. Most of the activities are in these territories. Here, you know, think about Suleiman the Great uh, and his uh, expeditions towards Eastern Europe, etc. And of course, Egypt is important and so on. So Iraq, Iraq is not important and Iraqi Jews are not important simply because, you know, this is actually the Eastern parts of the empire, okay? Now we come to the British Empire. And Baghdad is again, is, a, is in the center. It's, if you imagine the British Empire, it's a, the empire is all over the world, but also as an Asian empire, suddenly, you know, Baghdadi Jews find themselves in the center. What kind of a center? They are the center of a, basically of an empire that is created with, first by trade, you know, but the activities of the British in India Company, you know, and spreads to the east and the Indian Ocean through the Indi British India Company uh, uh, and so on. The centrality of Baghdad in this context is because, you know, it is a very, very important, you know, node that connects a, a, a very old minority, the Jews in this context, that are, you know, part of the Indian Ocean trade for centuries. They seize the opportunity, to, so, so to speak, and so on. And, of course, as we're going to talk about later, they reach out to India and to China and to Indonesia and to Singapore and so on. That's because Baghdad is suddenly finds itself in the center, okay? Um, and I'm going to close in one minute in, in, in this context because the stories are, um, 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 because the story is ra rather well known, okay? Um, when we jump to the 20th uh, century, we see something different. And this is when we begin to talk about displacement. You know, it's very strange to think, do we think about Baghdadi Jews in Hong Kong as displaced? I'm not sure, because since they are, they are part of that world, Okay. When do we have? When we begin to talk about displacement? When all of these empires actually turn into nation states? Yes. So you can say that to summarize that, you know, the story of or the dramatic story of Iraqi or Iraqi uh, history, Iraqi Jewish history in the 20th century is in fact that very old imperial history of thousands of years is suddenly translated itself into four nation states. The first one is Iraq itself. The second one is the state of Israel. The third one is India. You, you can even say uh, the, the, fi the fifth one is China, and the, uh, the fourth one is China, and the fifth one is in England itself, you know, the post-imperial England. And you see Jews, you know, moving into these nation states, you know, or uh, experiencing the translation, the transformation into nation states from imperial uh, history to national history as part of, you know, the, as part of the dictate their migrations. You know, of course, the mass migration, there's mass migration to Israel, there's mass migration, there's some sort of migration to London because the empire, the British Empire is folding, people living in, people living in China after liberation, people living in India after liberation. Um, um, and of course, uh, Iraq itself is a sort of a displacement because Iraq, the modern Iraq, you know, is not the Iraq that used to be before. You know, it's not Iraq that was part of a, an empire before. So this is kind of a historical overview that brings us to the national history, which is the strong suit. A hard act to uh, follow. Although I have to say that Tzvi's family is originally from um, Mosul, and so it gives me a lot of pleasure to hear him speak about the centrality of Baghdad uh, in all of his talks. Uh, but that's a minor. Uh, yes, okay. Okay. And so um, when we talked about how to sort of divide this, Tzvi told me like, okay, I'll do, you know, um, destruction of the first temple until the British Empire, you take the rest. So obviously I have an easier task, but we also thought about starting with personal stories and each of us would, you know, choose a person that we think uh, kind of 
you know, materialize, manifest a lot of the processes that we uh, look into. And the person that I chose is somebody who was dear to many people in this room. Um, he was a teacher of, he was my teacher. He worked closely with uh, Lita Levy and um, Nancy Berg, uh, he was uh, David uh, Bassoon's neighbor, um, and I'm talking about the late professor uh, Sasson Sommer. Uh, but I, w I want to emphasize here not just as his role as a mentor, but also the processes that have to do with the rise of the Iraqi nation state and how his life uh, embodies them. And you will find uh, things that I say in his bio that kind of speak to a lot of the things that we heard uh, yesterday. Um, so Sumer was born in the early 1930s and his education really follows the patterns that the nation state has to offer to elite uh, Jewish family. So he graduates from the posh uh, Jewish uh, high school of Shamash where he studies uh, Arabic but also English. Um, he loves the Arabic culture. He's educated by Arab intellectuals who were mentioned before, Hassan Muru, Muhammad Sharara, Sori and others. And he loves the Arabic language. He publishes in newspapers, he writes uh, poetry, um, and it becomes part of the fabric uh, of his life. Um, if you read his autobiography, it's peppered with his institutions that later on become very important to Iraqi Jewish life in the modern period, the coffee shop, the newspaper, uh, the, the editorial of the newspaper, um, the public readings of poetry, and so forth. But I think that one thing that kind of, uh, you know, marks the shift between uh, Iraqi Jewry in the Hashemite period and our later history is something a, a bit, uh, you know, an episode that happens to Sasson Sumer after the 1948 war in Palestine. So Sumer had to uh, stay in summer school to repeat a class and um, some girl in high school that he had a crush on just kind of looked at him uh, uh, in a very dismissive look. So he published, so he wrote a whole poem about how this girl humiliated him with her smile and so forth. And he wanted to publish this poem and the editor of the newspaper said, I can't publish this. Your name is Sumer and everybody will think that, uh, you know, the girl is Judaism, the Arab lover uh, represents Palestine and, you know, we can publish it. And this is like a small incident, but it's about, you know, a Jewish guy who wants to write something quite cheesy. I read the poem about his uh, love to this uh, wonderful girl or not so wonderful girl. And it's immediately being interpreted as uh, related to Palestine. But more broadly, um, his family need, uh, feels that they uh, need to immigrate um, and they come to, uh, to Israel of the 1950s. And then there is a story that Sumer rarely told, uh, but told it more in recent years. They live in a transit camp in a Mabara, in a tent, uh, in a place called uh, the transit camp or the Mabara of Ranana. And the father was a very prominent uh, banker, lost all his property, um, is now living in a tent. You know, the people are telling them, you know, it's better to live by the, the showers, that you have a better uh, shack there than a, than a tent. They live there. And the father actually managed just to reconstruct his life and find a position in a bank, but they never quite uh, make it. The mother still reads the British journals that she read in Baghdad. Uh, the father keeps writing letter in very posh English, trying to reconstruct uh, or find out what happened to their property in Baghdad. Um, and he dies at a young age. Uh, but the, the other interesting thing, which was mentioned also before, is that Sasan Sumer's life shows that you can take the boy out of Baghdad, but you can take Baghdad out of the boy, uh, in a sense that, you know, he reaches out initially to people who speak in Arabic. Um, and here, in this stage of migration, it's important to remember that um, when they're placed in these transit camps, before they have Hebrew, um, Iraqi Jews can talk, let's say, to Moroccan Jews or Tunisian Jews because the dialects are very different and they don't have Hebrew yet. But they can speak to Palestinians because the dialects are, are closer. Um, and so the young Sasson Sumer, who is frustrated by what he sees by the pains of migration, actually reaches out to the Palestinians and he publishes in Arabic in the newspapers of the Communist Party, in Al Ittihad, uh, the Daily, in Al Jadid, and later on when he masters the Hebrew language also in Kol Ha'am. Now, Sumer would later on not be a communist, and he would uh, find a venue to kind of uh, to social mobility, which is education. 
a venue that was very important in Baghdad and uh, becomes very important in Israel. Uh, he um, joins Tel Aviv University, who's a new university, he had no funds to study uh, at the Hebrew University, but when Tel Aviv University is established, they give more stipends. Um, and then he um, gets uh, his, ba uh, his bachelor degrees, he's very interested now in the Hebrew language, but he continues his education uh, in Oxford, where again he meets Arab intellectuals fellow Iraqis uh, who come from uh, from Iraq, Egyptians, his mentor, uh, Badawi is Egyptian, and he writes a lot about, again, Arabic culture and Arabic literature. Now, his studies are mostly not about Iraq. They're about the Nahada, the period of the Arab Renaissance in the Arab world. They are about Nagib Mahfouz, the Egyptian writer. But you can see, if you read his writing closely, that he's interested in these uh, folks that are in between cultures in between uh, empires. Um, and so, and he calls his uh, autobiography in uh, Arabic, you know, Baghdad yesterday, the making of the Arab Jew. And as Emil said, we, Emil Cohen said yesterday, we can argue what this uh, term signifies, but there is no doubt that um, he is a part of uh, Arab culture uh, and a culture that he tried to sort of commemorate and study and understand and as the people in this room know, uh, to to sort of, you know, to, to make his students interested in that. So also this question of continuity uh, was very important to him. So how is this story different than kind of the imperial story uh, that uh, Tzvi uh, told uh, beforehand? So I think, you know, this con I, I was assigned with the nation state, but I do have to say something about uh, the Ottoman Empire, because there's this sense that the life of Iraqi Jews as kind of modern Iraqi subjects, as Iraqi patriots, later on as refugees, um, is a product of, uh, you know, the 20th century and uh, the, the sort of British occupation of Baghdad and the creation of uh, you know, Iraq from the three former Ottoman uh, provinces. Uh, but in fact, Ottoman Iraqi Jewish uh, modernity, the lives of the Jews under the Ottoman Empire that had a series of reforms known as, a, as the Tanzimat um, was instrumental to the life of Iraqi Jews. And this is something that we'll explore uh, in this conference at length. So the fact that Jews, uh, um, could participate in the new politics that the Ottoman state initiated from the mid 19th century onwards. There were Jews in the Iraqi, in the Ottoman parliament of which we'll hear about. Jews benefited from the entrance of foreign schools to the Ottoman empire. That's the beginning of the Alliance school, uh, the famous uh, French Jewish network, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is established in Baghdad and later on in Mosul and in Basra and kind of gives Jews French and the tools of social mobility that enables them later on to integrate uh, into the British administration. This is also the period of uh, the rise of Baghdad and Basra as uh, important cities within the province of Iraq. So here, yes, the, the developments in the empire are, um, are essential. But also the, the sort of developments in Iraq are not determined just by uh, what happens in Istanbul and how it affects the whole empire, but also um, concerning the dynamics within the province uh, itself. So processes that we see in the, in the Iraqi nation state, like the rise of Baghdad, the migration to Baghdad from uh, the north and uh, the south, the interest in the Arab culture, they start already in the late Ottoman period. And we'll hear more, more about it, but a, a very important moment in, uh, in, this, um, in this framework is the 1908 constitutional revolution in the Ottoman Empire, where subjects, minorities, uh, feel that they have uh, a say in the Ottoman Empire. And they, um, if you look at what uh, the Jews write in Hebrew and uh, in, uh, in Arabic, especially in Arabic, after the 1908 constitutional revolution, it is no different than what their Muslim and Christian neighbors are writing in Iraq and elsewhere outside of the empire. This is the age of progress. This is the age of modernity. The tyranny of Abdel Hamid II is, lo is long gone, and now we will, uh, uh, you know, we will all live in an age of uh, prosperity and brotherhood. Jews of this period start publishing in Arabic 
public, if you look at the newspapers that are published and gain license uh, in uh, Iraq in this period, uh, you see that a lot of Jews are part of this uh, venue. Now, um, with empires and with modernity also come new languages. Um, and here it's important to think not only about, you know, uh, Arabic and Hebrew, but also about uh, another imperial language, which is Ottoman Turkish. Jews also knew Ottoman Turkish. They also um, wrote in Ottoman Turkish. And you'll hear more when Annie Green will speak about Heskel Sassoon and about uh, sort of language hierarchies in the Ottoman Empire. But if you look at libraries, uh, and we have records of some Jews from Suleimania, from uh, the north, but also from Baghdad. You see how much Ottoman modernity, you know, the novels in Ottoman um, were important to Iraqi Jews. And you also see, and this is interesting, that even in the later period, um, when someone like Samir Naqash, who was a famous Iraqi Jewish author who wrote in Arabic all his life, when he writes and he wants to characterize um, a person that was born in Iraq in the 1880s or in the early 1900s, he would pepper his Arabic in the Judeo Arab in the Jewish dialect with uh, Turkish words to show the transition between the, the times. And now we come to, and again, we'll hear much more about this uh, in, the, uh, in our conference. Now, in the Ottoman period, and this is something that we alluded to, the connections with India are still very strong. Uh, and we're very uh, fortunate to have with us uh, Joseph Sassoon, who's writing the history of the Sassoon family. And we'll hear from Lita Levy about the, the literary products of this uh, sort of Iraqi Indian modernity. But what's interesting in this relationship is that, you know, the, the sort of imperial relationship are not determined by a center and periphery, but they're determined also by the relationship between different peripheries. So there's a Judeo-Arabic press in India, people send, uh, uh, um, you know, family members exist in both India and um, and in Iraq. Uh, there's also an expansion to the Gulf. But again, you can't understand this solely by relying on uh, Jewish networks or uh, British networks. You need to read the works of people like Abdullah Thabit and in particular Hala Fatah to understand how these networks operate within an Arab Iraqi Ottoman context that later on uh, continues in the modern period to understand uh, their establishment, their circulations, why the community appear uh, in Bahrain, why we have, uh, you know, family uh, names like El Kuwaiti and so forth within the Jewish context. Now, moving to the uh, modern period or the, the period of the Arab state, um, there's a tendency to sort of think about nationalism and something that destroys, right? So nationalism comes and all this kind of cosmopolitan uh, networks that existed in uh, the imperial uh, period disappear. But not all nationalism is the kind of repressive nationalism that we identify in the kind of post-1968 or 1963 or whatever we want to call it uh, of Iraqi history. There are other kinds of nationalism and uh, the nation state uh, opens up certain venues um, that um, are actually helpful for, um, for Iraqi Jews. It doesn't mean that we have to accept nationalism wholesale, but we do have to recognize some of the things that created uh, this Arab Jewish culture that we were talking about uh, yesterday, or the Arab culture of Iraqi Jews, or whatever we want to call it. Uh, because in some ways, it is a product of the state. It is the state that improves first under the British mandate in the 20s, and then at their own right, uh, and then out of their own initiative, the transportation between the south and the, um, and the north and the center. Now, of course, there are sectarian politics, there are areas that are preferred and areas that are less preferred, but uh, regions are connected and people can migrate uh, more frequently. So the, the connections that the Ottomans started uh, forming in the migration from the south and the north to Baghdad and the rise of the three cities of Baghdad, Mosul and Basra continues very much um, in this period. A second point is education, of which, again, you'll hear quite a lot from, uh, you, we heard it from uh, Sami, you'll hear it more uh, from Emil Cohen um, and from others. But the fact that the state initiates schools, the fact that the state uh, invests 
not enough in the education of the lower middle classes and especially the fact that the state uh, makes the point that uh, folks in uh, Jewish private schools like Alliance, like Shamash, like Frank Annie, uh, will hear um, and will be taught uh, by Arab teachers who are not Jewish, um, civics, history, geography, uh, creates the Arab culture of uh, Iraqi Jews. It started before in the Ottoman Empire, but now when you have texts and um, you know textbooks that are initiated by the te by the state and teachers who are coming and teach these kinds of things, um, the background for Jews who like Al Ma'arri and Al Mutanabbi and the poetry of Imrul Qais and all these kinds of things that um, we heard about, um, sort of we can understand that if we understand the educational politics of the state. Um, and I'll be talking more in my paper about how contentions these politics were um, in both the Iraqi scene in general and in the Jewish uh, scene in particular. But if you ever travel to Ol Yehuda uh, and the Center for Babylonian uh, Heritage there and you see the Arabic text. Um, the Jews studied from their um, Arabic that were written by people like Ezra Haddad and others. Um, you see that they're no different than uh, many of the textbooks that were taught in, in other schools. Um, and so this product is a product of education, but as Sami uh, indicated yesterday, it's also uh, born in uh, an urban context where Jews leave the purely Jewish neighborhoods. Some of them move to posh, mostly uh, Jewish neighborhoods, especially the upper classes, but it's in the middle classes and the lower middle classes that the integration uh, is most felt because people leave uh, neighborhoods that were, uh, that were solely uh, Jewish, uh, um, or, or very Jewish, like, uh, you know, Taura or Tatran or Abu Sifin, they get more money, they integrate into the new economy of the state that, especially in the 40s, uh, is getting a boost of um, the years of the war and afterwards. Um, and they move from, uh, you know, solely Jewish neighborhoods to the mixed neighborhoods, to Mahadiya, to uh, uh, Bab Sheikh, to other places where they integrate with um, uh, with uh, Jews and with other Jews, but also with Muslims, with Christians, with other Iraqis. Um, and the fact that they had a framework that was called Iraqi patriotism, the fact that you can say, and I think this was uh, referenced yesterday in Emile's poem, you know, um, religion is, is sort of the matter of the home, but the homeland is for everybody, um, it was something that actually um, appealed to many. Now, um, and, and in that sense, before we move to sort of the post-1948 uh, period, I want you to think about the papers in our conferences integrated, right? So you'll hear uh, papers about the history of Amba, but you can't understand the history of Amba and the history of Iraqi food without understanding the rise of restaurants and coffee shops and the fact that people don't, especially men, don't just eat in their homes, but they also um, eat outside. Uh, you will hear about the Jewish uh, uh, musician, Salim Abbas, the Kuwaiti brothers and so on, but you can't understand their activities without understanding the rise of the Iraqi radio, without understanding the fact that as part of Arab conferences, um, Iraqi Jewish musicians are being sent on Iraqi delegations to perform their music. So while the paper kind of, the papers zoom in on different subjects, we need to think about them as integrated. Um, obviously the mass migration was uh, a big shock. Um, and here, um, you know, we're talking about those who stay behind. Um, and we heard quite a lot about it, and we'll hear more about it from Khairi Makhzoumi and, um, and stayed in Iraq, and, I have to, and, and those who entered uh, to Israel. And since we heard um, a lot about sort of those who uh, stayed in Iraq until 68 or 72, I want to make a brief comment about uh, the folks who arrived to Israel. So it's well known that uh, Iraqi Jews who um, arrived to Israel um, lived in poverty, but it's in recent years that, this, that we discover how horrendous the situation in the transit camp uh, camps was uh, in terms of food, in terms of baby mortality, in terms of uh, livelihood. Uh, these are very um, heartbreaking, um, these are heartbreaking stories of people who tried to reconstruct their lives. 
And the ones who survive this uh, system, and Esther Meir has shown this, are people who actually had social capital that they brought from, uh, from Baghdad. Uh, the merchants lost most of their money. Some were able to reconstruct it, some were not. Um, but it is the, the people who had social mobilities, you know, women who knew English or French and could work for the telephone company, um, accountants that were trained under the British uh, system and could transfer knowledge that they acquired about, you know, certain custom laws under the British mandate to Israel that was also formed by rules of the British mandate. Um, but in many ways, you know, when we um, celebrate the success of Iraqi Jews in Israel today, it is despite of uh, what they encountered uh, in the 1950s, not only because of what they encountered. And I think that this is uh, important to note. And, and in this conference, again, we would like to uh, reconstruct um, some of these moments. And, and you will hear quite uh, in the last day of the conference about the life of Israel, but all, in, of Iraqi Jews in Israel, but also, and this was uh, the thing that was important to us, the connections between uh, Israel and Iraq in terms of language, in terms of uh, you know resistance, um, how the communists, the Jewish communists in Iraq, reinvented themselves in Israel, like the Kujaman family and others. So this is the last day. The last point I want to make is that this conference also. Um, is about diversity of experiences, and I've mentioned this yesterday, uh, the fact that we can talk about a single Jewish uh, Iraqi experience. First of all, the experience was different between Basra and Mosul um, and Baghdad. It was different between the provincial towns, people who lived in Anna or Hela or um, Ramadi. It was different uh, geographically. Um, it also included the Kurdish Jews. So these were Aramaic-speaking Jews who lived in uh, the Kurdish uh, areas of the north. Um, and it's a very misleading term because we're also talking about communities who lived, let's say, in Suleimania or Kirkuk, who are northern and are not necessarily Aramaic-speaking. Um, we're living in a context of quick migration where people move from the hinterland to provincial towns, from provincial towns to Baghdad, Basra, and Mosul. Um, and people change their economic fortunes. Uh, quite uh, quickly. Um, class plays a neighborhood uh, a role, uh, location uh, plays a role, age plays a role, and gender plays a tremendous role. And these categories are constantly shifting, but it's worthwhile remembering them. So think about a poor Jewish woman, Aramaic speaking from Zaho, and then think about an affluent Jewish woman who lives in Basra. Uh, think about uh, somebody who lives in a neighborhood like Abu Sifan in Baghdad, and think about somebody who lives in the posh suburb of Batawin. Think about uh, a young Jewish child who's exposed to a religious education vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a woman who is taught in the Alliance schools for girls. They have different patterns. They have things that tie them together in terms of urbanization and labor and migration, but they also have immense uh, differences. And it's kind of the this differences between um, what ties people together and what set them apart is something that we're seeking uh, to uncover. Um, and we're, we'll also look finally at the productive uh, role of uh, nostalgia. And initially I prepared um, two poems that I wanted to read, but I think you'll have enough poetry uh, in this conference. So I'll just end with a quote that was written by a woman that was called um, Amal Saleh. She was born Amal Saleh, and then she changed her name to Tikva Agassi. Now, that's a point that I want to uh, make very briefly, is that a lot of Iraqi Jews who uh, were born with Arab names or with foreign names later on changed their names when they migrated to Israel. It was either forced or uh, people did it to integrate. So, um, you know, the the kind of the breakthrough is also um, embodied in the fact that people that Iraqis knew as uh, Suleiman and as Amal and Aziz and Murad and all these names later on have names like Eli and Tikva and others in Israel. So this is also something. So Amal Saleh Tikva Agassi writes this um, about sort of her Israeli patriotism, but she makes the following um, comment. And this comment brings us back to Mesopotamia with which uh, Tzvi opened. I do not know why Abraham, our father, had to leave Mesopotamia and her abundance of waters and fertile lands, which quite a few people believe to be paradise, and come to Palestine, a forsaken desert land. 
So she's saying what the people of, uh, told Ezra at the time in Babylon. It doesn't mean that I do not like Jerusalem, whom God sanctified for the Jews. It is sacred to me, and it is the pearl of all the cities in the east after we built it. But I would have liked God to leave Abraham in Mesopotamia, which in my opinion is a much more convenient to the worship of God and for the building of a temple than in this desert land like Palestine. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.